Good evening, I'm Libby Fitzgerald. My guest tonight, I'm sure, needs little introduction. He, Senator Barry Goldwater has been the United States Senator from the state of Arizona for the past 22 years, and he was, of course, the Republican presidential candidate in 1964. He has gone over the past almost 12 years from being a bitterly attacked candidate to being a highly respected elder statesman in Washington. I'd like to welcome him warmly to Lynchburg. I'd like to reminisce with him tonight a little bit about 1964, uh, as well as touching on some current issues, and I'd like in particular to discuss some of the major points of his new book, The Coming Breakpoint. To start with a little history, Senator, it is uh, well known that your habitual public candor was probably one of the factors that hurt you the most in 1964. If you had it to do again, would you be a tiny bit less candid in the interest of getting yourself elected? No, I don't think so. Uh, I never have been. I always, I find it easier to go to sleep at night if you don't have to worry about what you said all day. And I know your dad was the same way. We talked a lot about it. You have no regrets at all that no. you uh, perhaps didn't skirt some issues or you know, sidestep others in, uh, in the interest of... You no. Know, when you lose as badly as we lost, uh, or I lost, there's no, you, sometimes it might, you might have your tie on wrong, your hair parted wrong, or you didn't have your teeth showing right, and you might lose votes, but I, I don't worry about it. Vietnam, of course, was another issue that, uh, yes. that destroyed you in that campaign. Many people have said uh, since that uh, perhaps what you did advocate there was, after all, the right thing to do. It would be interesting now to hear uh, from you what would you have done in Vietnam had you been elected president in 1964? I would have done exactly what I said I would have done. Uh, you see, uh, President Kennedy had sent uh, troops over there to fire, to shoot back. Now, that's war. And when you make the judgment of going to war, at the same second you make the judgment to win it. But he never did. And Johnson was even worse. Uh, I think I said during the campaign that I would have made a swamp out of North Vietnam. And I, I would have done just that, till they quit. And after about three days, four days of intensive bombing, the North Vietnamese would have quit. We would have had peace in that country and we would have won the war. Do you think that President Nixon finally, when, when he uh, took over the reins of government, did the right thing in Vietnam? The only determine? thing he could do. The country, our country, when uh, your father and I ran, our country was fairly well behind our efforts in Vietnam. But when it became obvious that Johnson didn't want to win, he didn't know what to do, then the people started getting mad and I don't blame them. Uh, they would have they would have understood what I would have done and they understood Nixon when Nixon resorted to the heavy bombing by the B-52s it meant the end of the war even though we lost it so the Johnson's four years uh, there were really a wasted a wasted effort in terms of lives and well he really didn't understand the war he had no concept of war he wouldn't listen to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, every decision had to be his own, and uh, I don't care how smart the president is, that doesn't work. Lincoln nearly lost the war between the states because he wanted to be the general. Uh, another portion of your book that, that interested me very much, you devoted a whole uh, chapter, this is a, a book uh, that has just come out, The Coming Breakpoint, that the senator has written. You devote a whole chapter to what you call the uh, social security mess. Yes. Again, going back to 1964, uh, this, of course, is a touchy political issue, which you experienced in 64 when it was said that you wanted to abolish the entire system. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on the social security system at this point? Is it salvageable, and if so, how? Well, uh, I actually never have advocated doing away with it. I w wanted to see it voluntary. Now, I'll admit, at that time, it wasn't popular. But if a person were running for president today on the idea of abolishing Social Security, I think the young people of America would elect him. Uh, they don't like the idea that they have to put so much of their own earnings 
plus the earnings of their employer into a fund that is in very, very bad shape. It's in such bad shape that no one in Washington, no one that I've found, can tell me or anyone how much money is in the Social Security Fund and how long it's going to last. Uh, the only thing I can go on is that when it first was started, we had about four people working to take care of one retired person. That's getting very close to one to one. And that has always doomed any uh, system like this. It happened in France and it's happened elsewhere. I can't give you the answer that I'd like to give as to, is it salvageable? I think if we politicians would quit making uh, a football out of it and say to every American in this country, you're going to get what's due you, but we're going to then give you the chance to say whether you want a social security system or not, and those that want it can go under one, and those who don't want it don't have to have it, then I think we can uh, work it out. Well, one wonders, uh you know where and how and when change can come in an area like this because as you say it is uh, it's not a popular thing for politicians no. to talk about in the first place and uh, for them really for anyone to get up on the house or the senate floor and advocate a change in the system is going to alienate some people back home in their district how is change ever going to be brought about in this area it's got to come from the congress does it not it has to come from the congress but there's an old saying we have we see the light very fast but it takes a while to feel the heat now the retired person living on social security knows something's wrong with it some of them are having trouble getting checks uh, others uh, most others find it's not enough to live on uh, nobody tells them the truth about the system i think what whoever the next president is one of the first things he should do is to get a series of simple charts and just say, fellow Americans, this is where you stand relative to Social Security. Now, you see, this money that we've paid in is our money. It doesn't belong to the federal government. It's supposed to be someplace in a cigar box or in a nice safe bank. Or but no one can find it. Nobody can <laughs> find it, and they've been using it for other purposes, and they won't tell us the truth. Well, it is true, then, that the system is near bankruptcy. There, there are, in my judgment, it is. Are not, there is not enough money in it to, at this point, to cover. I, I think um, uh, the payments do. I think any banker would call that approaching bankruptcy. Uh, is the, the tax you felt also in your book? I believe that the tax, the, the Social Security income tax, is getting to the point where it's just going to be too burdensome for, for many people's incomes. Well, Senator Fong of Hawaii worked it out actuarially a few years ago that if a young person starting work today put the same amount of money that he puts into Social Security into a private fund, when he retired at the age of 65, he'd have about four times as much money coming to him. That's why I like that. Well, now, this is, the, I think, the question on people's minds. What is the alternative to, uh, to a, you know, an all-inclusive federal plan such as Social Security. Isn't there a fear that uh, some people just won't be covered, some people will be excluded, uh, and in their old age won't, won't have sufficient support? Well, some people are excluded today. Airline pilots aren't covered, for example. Doctors aren't covered, but uh, that's beside the point. If we said to everyone, don't worry about it, you're going to get the money that you've put into it as long as you live. Because if we have to, we'll take that money out of the federal fund. But we're going to have an election and let you decide, you young people, whether you want to continue putting part of your salary into the Social Security kitty or not. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Then we devise a, another system. I think there would be enough people that would want to have a Social Security system that would vote for it and then let them take it. Mm -hmm. Have an element of choice. That's right. There's so many other issues uh, that arose in 64 that would be interesting to reminisce about. But do you feel like, um, in a way, you would rather run today, in 1976, uh, rather than 1964 for the presidency? Do you feel, in a sense, that you ran at the wrong time, the wrong year, in the wrong political climate against the wrong man? People have said you were a man before your time. Oh, I hate to 
try to comment on something like that. Uh, the, the truth is that no Republican could have won in 64. The country wasn't ready for three presidents in about two and a half years. Now, we knew that, and I'll never forget the day up in a hotel room in San Francisco when your father and I sat there working on an acceptance speech, laughing our heads off, because over in the corner, the opinion research uh, poll outfit was showing us we were 20 and Johnson was 80. And your dad says, hell, let's not write an acceptance speech. Let's <laughs> write a speech and tell him to take it and we'll go home. <laughs> well, that's what so many people have said since, of course, is did you ever think you had a chance? And I think in so you, that's true, and yet in some sense I think you uh, have to go into it believing that, that it could thought, be, that we it could thought happen. We, we thought we could win, naturally. I think the uh, biggest effort was to take the control of the Republican Party away from the people who had been literally destroying it, uh, which we did. And it was, it, that made it possible for Nixon to be elected. I'm not overly happy about that now, but it, that made it possible. D you are deeply concerned in your book um, about the direction that the yes. country is taking mm -hmm. now. Perhaps you could expand on that for a few minutes. Well, that's why I called it the coming breakpoint. Breakpoint in this case meaning the point that the American citizen will arrive at when he says, I don't want any more like this. I'm tired of high taxes. I've ti I'm tired of the government telling me what I have to do, running my business, running my profession, telling doctors what they can and can't do, uh, telling our local school boards who they're going to hire, what they're going to teach, and all of that. I think the day is coming when the American people, I hate the word revolt because it sounds bad, but we've, this nation has been in a constant state of revolt ever since we fought the war with the King of England, and we always will be. I think uh, the, break, the break point will, will be shown by Americans refusing to elect the present members of Congress. Uh, making drastic changes in governors, mayors, and so forth and so on. In other words, nothing wrong with our form of government. What's wrong with it have been the people who we've allowed to get in it since the early 1930s who will promise literally anything to get reelected. That becomes a way of life, living in Washington uh, at what is now a fairly good salary in, in uh, the best way to live. They don't like to give that up. But isn't that an inseparable part of politics, really? Uh, is there, you know, are there ever going to be a breed of politicians who don't promise everything uh, yes, on the face I of the earth so. in order to get reelected? I mean, that's the nature of the game, unfortunately. I think you're going to see a lot of young people who understand our form of government, who like our form of government, uh, and will get into politics and say, this is what I'm going to do. I think this is part of the big appeal of Carter on the Democratic ticket. He's not saying anything precise, but do Americans want to hear anything precise? Americans aren't crazy enough to think that there's some device that overnight will conquer unemployment. So Carter's going around talking about patriotism, his country, and God. And I think this is the major reason he's made all the headway that he's made. Mm -hmm. People are tired of the hackneyed old promises and, I can't use the word I'd like to use, that politicians <laughs> use. <laughs> we, all, we all probably know what you'd like to use. Um, a very surprising statement that you made in your book uh, was that, in fact, the president, neither the president nor the Congress run the country. That's it right. is run solely by the mm. mass of bureaucrats in Washington. That's right. I don't that know how many... And I'm not talking about the average civil employee who works for the government. Say up to about a grade 13. Uh, they do a splendid job. They work hard. They're dedicated. But when you get above that, you have usually a group of men running and women running these bureaus or agencies who've never had any experience in the field at all, who are political appointees. They're being paid back for something they did. 
I think, for example, of Environmental Protective Agency, uh, where I live. Now, this is something we all like. I'd like to see the rivers clean again. I'd like to see the air clean. But the man who runs the division where I live uh, was never across the Hudson River till he got the appointment. And uh, because of bad judgment, stupid ju judgment, he's getting very close to shutting down our biggest industry, which is mining. Well, now how, what, what is the answer to breaking down this, this enormous bureaucracy? I mean, is it a question of Congress taking inventory and, and eliminating duplication? And, but, but is anyone ever going to get to the point where they're brave enough to, uh, to cut, cut, cut across the board? It's already started. And believe it or not, it was started by a Democrat senator named Muskie who took an idea that I was a part of three years ago and brought it up to date. Now, here's what his bill will do. At the end of four years, every agency of government has to justify their existence. And not only that, every one, let's say, of the 1,600 different grant aids that are available to people in this country have to be justified or no more. Just chop them off. Uh, Colorado is doing that. Uh, I think California has started it. It's beginning to spread. We have so many bureaus in Washington that uh, I don't think anyone can tell you. It, in fact, it took Senator Roth of Delaware three years to make a list of all the agencies that uh, the taxpayer supports, and I think he's missed some in that list. So we should see henceforth a gradual elimination of some of these. When a Democrat gets up and proposes what I've just oh. suggested, you know the times come. It'll, it'll get done, well. Really. Yeah. The Panama issue, uh, to mm -hmm. come to, to something current, is a uh, confused issue, I think, in many people's minds. Is there, in fact, do you feel, any actual economic or military reason to maintain ownership of the canal? Yes, there is, for the time being. But to, get, to begin with, the Panama is not like Arizona or New York. It's not a state. It's not like Alaska or the Louisiana Purchase. We created Panama by getting them to revolt against Colombia, and then we dug the canal. And the canal has been occupied by the United States. Now, our biggest ships won't go through the canal. Uh, militarily, where we've used the canal zone for jungle-type training, we're using the southern part of the United States more and more. But the important thing for the American people to remember about this is 20 years ago, the United States had such strong prestige that Panamanians would never think about talking the way they're talking now. But after we were chased out of Vietnam, after we lost Angola, uh, uh, now that we don't occupy that dominant, strong position that we once did, the Panamanian can say, we're going to go to war over this, and they are not fooling. I've been down there twice to look into this thing. Not just Panama, but the great country of Mexico, Peru, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, will pit themselves against us unless we're willing to sit down and in a calm way say, well, is this possible? Maybe after 20 years, 25 years, Panama would have a bigger cut of the economics. After 40 to 50 years, we may be out of there completely, militarily. Uh, we're going to have to sit down and talk about these things. We haven't done it yet. Uh, probably after the election, probably after whoever is the next president, we will begin serious negotiating, but there's been not one sentence made yet that you could say is negotiating. I'm skipping around a little bit sure. because I'd like to hit on um, several big points before our time is up. The abuses of the CIA and the FBI, I think, are a grave concern to many Americans. Uh, where do you feel that the line must be drawn between necessary intelligence work and uh, unnecessary and unjust intrusion into the privacy of private, of, of private individuals? I think the law is already very, very clear on this matter. Now, as far as the CIA, I don't think it is the business of Americans to have to know everything the CIA does, nor do the Americans want to know. I think most Americans would much rather have us win our battles in a covert way, 
even though it costs us a lot of money, than have to go to war. And that's what the CIA actually does. They gather intelligence, they work in a covert at night way, round and round, and eventually stop something completely. Where if we went directly at it, we'd be in war. Now I found, in serving on that select committee on intelligence, that if you want to call the incidents abuses, then the abuses can be laid right on every president who's been in that White House because the CIA has not been guilty of anything they weren't ordered to do. Now the FBI maybe is another horse. Uh, I think that un under Mr. Hoover there were abuses. Uh, but again, if we have people running around this country like the Black Panthers and we don't have an agency uh, checking on them, I would be worried. Well, on the other hand, if that agency that checks on the Black Panthers uh, bugs your phone for no other reason than they just want to know a little more about you, then I say that's wrong, mm -hmm. and the law already covers that. So uh, should the FBI and the CIA, should you feel, be answerable to a congressional committee? Well, we're talking really two widely separated agencies. The CIA should occasionally, and they do, report to the Oversight Committee. I'm on that committee of the Armed Services. And frankly, many times we say, please, don't tell us. Mm -hmm. It's too highly classified, and we might just say something about it. So at our own request, we don't, we're not told everything. The FBI, on the other hand, is more like a, uh, a gigantic detective agency that chases down local crime, national crime, state crime, and so forth. And I think they could be answerable, uh, especially at budget time. They could come up and say, well, we've spent X millions of dollars on this or that or the other thing. But again, if it gets into anything that's highly classified, where the knowledge of it would help the criminal, then I'd say no. Mm -hmm. Uh, Henry Kissinger has unwittingly become a, an issue in this campaign. It seems, uh, of course, many images have been created of him, and I think no one really knows what to believe. And it seems for all the hours of negotiating that he's done, that in fact, he has very few lasting agreements, really, to show for it. How effective do you feel that he is, and how respected is he in Washington at this point, and how much of a fatal liability do you think he's going to be to President Ford's try for the nomination? Well, let me answer that in one broad statement. For the first time in 20 years, we're not at war. There's not an American being killed any place in this world. That's Henry Kissinger. Now, uh, let me go a step further. I've asked this question of people. Name me a Secretary of State in your lifetime that you've liked. They don't like Secretaries mm -hmm. of States. Why, I don't know. Now, Henry Kissinger is trying something that we haven't tried since John Foster Dulles, and that is personal diplomacy, uh, going to countries and representing the United States in a personal way. And uh, we, have, we have peace in the Middle East of a sort. We have peace where the war was, where trouble will pop, will pop up the next time, was not included in that peace. He's just gotten back from Africa, where uh, he made some pretty drastic promises and statements uh, that are going to be difficult to get through the Congress. But nevertheless, I think, I, I have to say that I think Henry Kissinger has done a good job. How respected do you feel that he is generally in Washington today? In Washington, I think he's very well respected. Okay. I think out around the country where people read funny little books about him and about everybody else in politics. He's not so well thought of, but... Uh, Will President Ford fire him before the nominating convention this summer, do you think? No, I think he'd be very foolish to. First of all, I'd like to know who's going to take his place. Do you think he'll keep him on if he is re-elected? I think that's up to Dr. Kissinger himself. He has several times said publicly that he'd like to go back to teaching. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that if he wants to do that, the president would let him do it. 
But again, you've got to keep in mind, we don't train people in this country like England and France and every other country in the world. When we go out to, to uh, negotiate with people, we're negotiating with 200 years of background. And some of these countries we talk to have been in the government business 3,000 years. And you'll see their comparable positions like Secretary of State filled by men who have been to colleges, they've been to prep schools, they've been in the business, and this is their whole life. He's not some man picked out of nowhere because he has a million dollars and he wants to be an ambassador. What are your plans for the future? I, I think you <laughs> yearn in a way to go back to your hill in Arizona, yeah. as you call it, but yeah. in your book you say you feel a certain sense of responsibility to stay around a while longer and right some of the wrongs that you see happening in Washington. Well, I, you know, I've been trying that for nearly 25 years. We haven't gotten very far. Uh, I'll be... I'll be about 71 years old when my term is up. And I've been through wars and been through politics, and I think my wife is deserving of a little attention. And I have 10 grandchildren. I'd like to start taking them camping and teach them how to hunt and fish and ride horseback. Uh, so I just, this may be my last hoorah. I don't I think when a man gets over 70 in politics, he, you ought to get the hell out of it. <laughs> Senator, our time is about up. I have enjoyed every minute of our conversation tonight, oh, and I'm to be with very you, pleased and very honored that you took time out of your busy schedule in Washington to come to Lynchburg and do this program with me. Fidelity National Bank are the ones that made this program possible as a public service, and I want to give a very special thank you to them. Thank you very well, much, and thank you. you to them. I'm Libby Fitzgerald. Good night.